Today's guest in Own Your Story is Carol Lamarck. She's a CEO founding partner at the Value Union Innovative Marketing and the CEO and talent cheetah. Carol is incredibly passionate about her profession, but she's very down to earth as well. In our conversation, we talked about the difference between trends and structural innovations that guide your work as a marketer. We talked about the pros and the cons of influences in your business and whether or not you should have a social media presence as a CEO. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the Own Your Story podcast, the place to learn about personality branding, thought leadership, and how to capitalize your reputation. In other words, how to own your story. I'm your host, Bianca Fleracas, former actress, turned into six-figure entrepreneur, author, and keynote speaker. Let's get started. <laughs> so, now, before I... Um, came into the call, I check your LinkedIn profile. What else? What well, else should we do? Check yeah. the LinkedIn profiles. And I read in the banner, I read the following, how to get marketing attract employees. Yes. So I have the impression um, that that's a really hot topic in marketing nowadays, the war for talents, uh, employer branding, how to attract uh, talents. So is there a shift happening in focus in marketing? Well, I hope not. Um, I believe that a marketeer should know what's happening in the market and look at the three biggest trends in general. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, every entrepreneur or every larger corporation has difficulties to find employees. So marketing should always think about what could be my added value in the growth of a company. Mm -hmm. And in general, we don't do uh, employee acquisition somehow. In general, we I didn't before. And then suddenly, yeah, yeah, like things happen all the time. Suddenly it becomes the new normal. But that's it should be a normal behavior to look at what's uh, trending um, mm -hmm. in this given period of time and, and, and try not to jump on everything. But if you see it's a structural issue, then of course you should uh, adapt your knowledge and try to, to help out. And this is one, this is a structural issue, a yeah. big issue. Yeah. Apparently I was uh, talking to my neighbor, uh, who's also an entrepreneur. I didn't talk to her, uh, recently because I've, I've been living here not for so long, so I don't mm -hmm. know everybody. And she's an entrepreneur apparently. And the first thing she said is, I lie awake at night because I can't find any personnel. And if I can't find no personnel, I can't grow. So you see everybody that you encounter, it's uh, in their top three of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you wonder uh, why, because we also meet a lot of people who don't find a job. So. Yeah. Why don't these companies and the people don't find each other? So what is what is the biggest pitfall you think that is happening in the companies? There's, that... there's clearly a mismatch somehow. Um, so I think both parties don't know each other very well. I don't think employees know uh, what the new employees are looking for. Uh, they probably don't know how to activate older people. So... I think it's the oldest trick in the book, get to know each other better. Yeah. Um, and, and then, of course, you have stakeholders like um, like schools and training, and you have a lot of that, um, and you can always pin it on someone else. But the two parts that need to find each other are the employer and the employee. So I mm -hmm. think the, the opportunities are uh, lie there. And you have a lot of people who are inactive as well, we have a, uh, as many in, inactive people as people looking for a job or officially mm -hmm. looking for a job. So there's a real mismatch in the yeah. market somehow. You invest a lot of time and energy in getting to know the next generation. Since I've uh, mm -hmm. uh, since, we, since we started working, you're always talking about the next the, the, the millennials and the Gen Zs, and and I was oh just. Just leave them. They're just still kids. But no, you're already working <laughs> with them. Um, yeah. Why are you so uh, interested in those next generations? It's, is it because they're your upcoming competitors or <laughs> or what? what? What is it? Upcoming customers, I would say, first. Customers uh, first. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't lie awake about competitors uh, that much. Uh, but I always am interested that in everything that's new to a market. So, of course, human beings, but also anything that is climbing up the adoption curve. So mm -hmm. it is a, a natural behavior for me to, to check out what's new. Uh, if it's a service, a product, a human, any novelty <laughs> in general. <laughs> and I try to go to the source of things. Where are the innovations coming from? Like in fashion, for instance, where we see a lot of innovations uh, that then trickle down to other industries. But that's probably the reason I mm -hmm. like use because they are the next thing for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since we started working, I started following you on social media, of course. And I really admire the way you attract interns and train them. I even started recommending people, uh, companies to work with your interns when they leave you and are looking for a job, or even to advise students to 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 try to become an intern in your company. But now in the summer of 2023, you started a new program, Cheetah. Yeah. To, yeah. yeah, you, you, yeah. I'm enthusiastic you, you, about it. <laughs> how did it go? Because it recently, you recently finished the first edition. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so I like to teach. I like to, to share what I know. Um, I, tr I try at least. I, try, I love to inspire people and educate them. And I like them to have fun while uh, having those new novelties coming in. And uh, when you like to teach while well, students are also some segments that you think about. And yeah, uh, we worked with a lot of different age groups uh, since we built our company. And we seem to be good at um, educating youngsters. So we kind of, by accident, let's say, again, it's probably uh, because I love all entrants in the market, but um, as I love to, to teach, I really do. Um, it's a natural thing to, to, to build a summer school. Um, we had one very a long time ago, five years ago or something, and it was already something nice to do. And then to see those youngsters grow and where they go, if they don't stay with us, where they mm -hmm. you, you have friends everywhere from other generations. So that I like a lot. I think you should stay relevant with everybody in all different uh, age groups. And uh, don't, don't become old with your own age. That's what I, I saw people do, like only having friends uh, in their own age group. And then, yeah, of course... You fade away with your own age group, which is not a bad thing, but it's just something I didn't want to do. Uh, and uh, as we are um, by accident, let's say, becoming an ex expert in those youngsters, those uh, young graduates, uh, we, we build our business around it and we deliver young marketeers to our clients who are looking for employees. And as we said mm -hmm. before, it's kind of hard to find the right people or to find people whatsoever. Uh, so we try to stick at what we're good at being marketing mm -hmm. and then try to deliver motivated, educated, uh, inspired youngsters. Yeah. And how do you attract your new talents? Yeah, well, I always <laughs> use the word magnetic <laughs> because then it suddenly kind of happens. Um, yeah, of course, it, you should be having a story you you should be telling something somebody cares about um and let's not forget those people these young people who have parents which happen to be one of the thirty thousand followers uh, i have and then sometimes i just ask parents do you have a kid looking for a <laughs> job <laughs> and this yeah and so uh, parents are also a target audience of course uh, and then yeah while the word of mouth as we are working with youngsters for eight years now, or in my, in my previous careers as well, I guess the word goes around and the secret must be, <laughs> so somebody should tell me what the secret is, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, in, it's, it's your, your willingness, your passion, your authentic, authentic willingness to tell a story that hopefully is compelling to the ones you want to talk to. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that can be youngsters, that can be parents, that can be a lot of people in my field, uh, mm-hmm. marketing, and just a willingness to be interesting yeah. should be magnetic to those you're yeah. looking for. Yeah. Now, in my book, Own Your Story, or someone else will, I advocate that employer branding only succeeds when you allow your employees to have their own personal brand. That is something I believe in. What is your opinion on that? Well, everything's fine with me. If it's in sync with the values you, of the company you work for, it goes. Mm-hmm. If it mm-hmm. doesn't, it doesn't. Simple as that. Um you can have your own brand. Of course you can. You are in your own brand. If willing or not, you are. But then again, if you compel a certain image that is totally in contrast with the company you work for, this, the story will not continue for long, at mm-hmm. least not in, in that constellation. You will have to look for another employer. So yes, but if you want to tell stories and if you like it and you, ha- you you happen to be good at it, I guess you have to discuss it with your new partner, your employer. It's a new mm-hmm. relationship you're building. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they will ask you questions, but it's also up to you as an a possible employee to, to check if the story you want to spread, that it's not conflicting in any way, mm-hmm. just checking it out. If, am I misunderstanding something? What do you think about what I think, what are my my values? Do you think it's in sync with the company? And what are the policies around here? Do you, mm-hmm. ha- do you have any? Because some companies are very touchy about those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're perhaps not in line with what the last generation wants to do, can be. But you better yeah. know it up front. So you advise... If you ask them, perhaps they will say, hey, what a good question. Let us let me come back to, to you about this. Uh, I never had that question before. Could be. Mm-hmm. So do you think guidelines need to be provided? Yeah, depending on how big the company is, um, it's like a village sometimes. Companies mm-hmm. are large and you have to have some guidelines like in circulation, eh? If it's yeah. a priority from right or left, it, it's nice to know not to encounter the wrong car, <laughs> the wrong <laughs> policy uh, when you, you're not aware of the rules. I, I, I can't believe that in a larger constellation, uh, you can just free wheel everything you want. It's uh, mm-hmm. called anarchy, I guess. So um, as, as when the company is too large to, to call somebody in the same day, to tell something, then you probably need some rules. Yeah. On top yeah. of on top of the culture, on top of the company culture, which is uh, unwritten rules everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course. I once was in a meeting uh, at a company, and one of the people in the meeting said, "Yeah, one of our employees has a TikTok following of 100k." Mm-hmm. And then I was wondering, what what, what do you do then? Because you already hired this person with that following, so probably yeah. you ha- you cannot ask this person quit. <laughs> Stop no, no, the train has already is already yeah. uh, rolling. So, um, do you think th- the decision of the um, employer will uh, keep that in mind? Probably yes. Probably yeah. Well, they- when I. When I was hired somewhere, I, I did, TikTok didn't exist, but I was working at a telco company. And on my first day, my uh, higher up vice president was fired on my first day. And my direct uh, boss already immediately thought about me, like there are 3,000 other employees to wonder about. But she said, yeah. Well, I'm going to warn Carol because she has a large following. I want to be the first to tell her because, yeah, the the grave line will tell her so fast mm-hmm. that I want to be the first. So depends on, on who you have in your team. And if and my yeah. boss at that time was so uh, smart or um, empathic to, to think about me that way. So mm-hmm. I think that's a good... Um, um, story that I uh, encountered and I, I know a lot of people who have a lot of following and that bosses mm-hmm. don't understand or feel threatened about it and 
yeah, it is something to to mind to mm -hmm. to keep in mind mm -hmm. because of it's a broadcaster. This person can indeed yes. do do communication, and then yes. I don't know if it's going to be positive or negative. But if this person has a larger broadcast than many magazines or or radio station, yeah, then it is a factor to to consider. Of course, of course, but and it's good of... that he's, this person is on your side. Yes, he's your yes. employee. It could be yes. the employee of the competitor, of course. So, yeah, yeah, but you have to know, you have to care about the people that much that you know that thing and that you don't mm -hmm. discover. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have the same story with uh, with the Twitter uh, with a Twitter uh, influencer, let's say, as uh, many years ago for. Uh, uh, plant and uh, food and animal uh, company that also uh, was already doing social media for the company without the CEO knowing it because he wasn't even aware what Twitter was all about. And this person was a big ambassador of the company, just tweeted around uh, and several months, like years later, the CEO s said, whoa, we're already on Twitter because we have an employee who's doing it for many months. So... It's all about knowing your people. It's not mm -hmm. easy if you have 10,000 people, but they all go through one HR process. So in a certain way, you are able to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When we started working together, you released your third book, Tada, yes. Zoonotic. And um, please please give a short uh, introduction to the book. So oh, I have to keep yeah. it away. Yes, thank what you very about? much, Yanka, for the. Yeah, I'm going to have a small advertising here. Yes. <laughs> well, very small, don't worry. Well, it's all about my passion going up the adoption curve, about spreading something, spreading adoption of anything, products, services. Uh, I wrote my first book on the same topic, being influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also about spreading through influencers, which was was a boom because it was just coming up at the right time. And I've been yeah. doing this for many years in my marketing plans. I always added influencer marketing somehow. Nobody really cared, but I always did it. <laughs> and, um, and then, yes, there is a, a larger thing to it. We all encounter, or we, kn we know by now what a virus actually is. We have been seeing for like 20 years viral marketing without really understanding what we're saying. Like it's a virus. <laughs> <laughs> so when we had the pandemic, we, we could understand it much better. And so I tried to explain it again. How do you go viral by looking at nature, by digging into how nature solves a big issue, being spreading, distributing the message and then I, I made like a, a cookbook with several exercises that companies can do at home <laughs> or with their teams uh, to try to, to grow exponentially. Because a lot of people ask me, how do we grow exponentially? <laughs> like I'm a wizard or something. But then I, I really try to, to look into a, one method uh, that you could follow and yeah. And hopefully you're going viral while you're listening to this podcast. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned the Synodic, your last book, and your first one, Influences, but you've forgotten the un unfair advantage. Yeah, the middle. And, <laughs> and <laughs> unfair advantage, the concept returns in Zoonotic. And yes. uh, it's it's not an easy concept. Huh? It's not easy to no. define. We we talked a lot about it. You had to explain it to me again and again. So what is the difference between unfair advantage and and uh, a USP? So go ahead, yeah. Carol, explain yeah. to our okay. listeners. Well, a marketeer can't do a serious job if the company is not different from another company. If you're an equal to so many, so many others, and in the digital age, you become faster than ever a copy of somebody else, well, it's, then it's very difficult for a marketeer to make the difference. Even for a salesperson, it becomes very difficult to make the difference. You only have one power left, which is the one you don't want to use, is the price. You can always lower your price to make a difference. But uh, when I... Uh, was um, learning uh, marketing at school, our professor always uh, scratched the four e fourth element in marketing being pricing. They, they asked us to fill in a lot of exercises and to avoid using price as a mechanic. 
So you had to be different in so many ways in everything that was left, like your communication, your channels, your, your service, your proposal. Uh, and that's the whole trouble I saw on, on the markets and the, all the entrepreneurs around me. They suddenly had uh, the, the negative side of being equal to somebody else in the US or, or in another province. They could live like for 200 years uh, and not even being very different, but the the area was helping them uh, to not get too many competitors. But the internet makes the world flat and small. So suddenly they had big difficulties um, and they all, they all were just competing on price. So to me, it is the extreme difference. It is being very unique in every way, not only in your communication like the unique selling proposition uh, is trying to solve is only trying trying to solve advertising complexities by delivering only one single message that's the unique selling proposal eh? proposition no the unfair advantage is hard for the competitors to find to to understand why you are so different because you're different in so many ways you're also different in who you hire what you stand for. It's in everything you do. It's what the finance officer does. It's what the HR director does. And not only what the marketing director does. You're just so hard to beat. You're so, so hard to copy that everybody envies you. That's what the book is all about. Making people want to be envied and not Calimero, like complaining. I don't like that so much. So you have your own future in your own hands. Be different and try to change uh, how you are today to to remain future proof, but but it's it's difficult to to find your own unfair advantage. It's yeah. like the blind spot. Yeah, it's a puzzle. Um, but I think every company I worked for, and I've been working for on my own and with my with my co-founder for eight years, everybody is different. Uh, a lot of uh, family-owned companies are their their DNA, their culture is very different. The product may be the same in the end, uh, which I'm, I, I advise them to change. But when you talk to them, they're so different one family versus another. So the the difference lies within the DNA of the company is already there somewhere. They just can't pronounce it. They can't yeah. make a compelling uh, message or a new product out of it. So I in the book, it's again it's very a cookbook, uh, I give um, very different options. You can look into 49 strong forces that you probably have and by elimination or conviction, you will find your, your own uh, unfair advantage. And I found unfair advantages for every company I've been working for. Mm -hmm. It's there somewhere. They just have to look. It should be authentic. It should be close to their DNA and they should believe in it so much that they they explain it back to me as if they invented it on their own. That's yeah. when I succeed because then it lives through the company yeah. uh, and they can build upon it for, let's say, three years because it's not something you can build in a week most of the time. Mm -hmm. But then you see the direction you have to go, uh, how to become unfair and how to be the one who's envied and not be a Calimero anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're very passionate about that. But yeah. is, is, the, is, it, <laughs> is the unfair advantage um, towards the customer the same as towards attracting new talent? Or could that be something different? Well, it could be different because to internally, you know much more about the company. When you go outside, it becomes sometimes the un, the unique selling proposition, the, the just one thing you want to say in the quarter that is in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite short term, but it could be that you have so much much assets in your company, you're not prepared to tell them right away. You're gonna do it in a, a tripify kind of way, uh, and so the confidential part of the unfair advantage is so much richer than what you add to to an advertisement or, or something. So to employees, you can say much more uh, mm -hmm. things that you don't need to say uh, outside. Yeah, yeah. Now, for me, the idea of the or the concept of an unfair advantage is also something you need in your personal branding. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think it's I, a good I idea. So. <laughs> I hope so. I you think so. Because you, you once said to me, um, do do not 
uh, deny your unfair advantage. And, and I was like, oh, do I have one? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah okay but it's the so, hardest thing to do it for yourself that's that's the hardest thing it's easier to do it for somebody else it's always yeah. the case yeah you probably see it from someone else but not from you. yeah do you do you know your own fair advantage well i think <laughs> i <laughs> no, that's so, it's not humble at all so but i'm from antwerp so you forgive me uh well i think i'm unique uh, everybody is um i uh I, like everybody, you have a certain visual expression, eh? like you have your beautiful hair, uh, Yanka, which is your personality. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. I have, uh, look at me, I have my hair. <laughs> I but have you, my personality. You have special hair as well. <laughs> yeah, should, I do, I should. think. Yeah. Well, depending on where you live on earth, I have uh, special hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, so it's same when I was a kid, yeah, well, well exactly. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I was kind of, unique at that point in time, uh, visually, uh, it's sometimes hard for a kid to be different, uh, but then it becomes who you are and you become proud of it and you can, you become known for it. Uh, and it starts there with just visual elements that were different for me versus other kids. Um, and then you try to, you try to, yeah be a passionate person and yeah for me passion equals what i love to do being marketing in the largest sense of the word uh, and i am that obsessed by it that it's it's hard to beat somebody with so much passion for a single thing i'm mm -hmm. not saying there are not other good marketeers in the world i love to talk to them um but it's hard to beat somebody who is having yeah, multiples of 10,000 hours of passion. I, I do sleep about my passion. I do dream about it. I, I do solve things sometimes while I'm sleeping. And then I remember them in the middle of the day, like not when I wake up, but then later on in the middle of the day, I say, oh, yes, yes, that was a solution. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of scary. Um, I do uh, sleep, dream, eat marketing all the time. And I guess it's, it's, um, it's part of the of the unfair advantage, probably mixed with a lot of energy. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it has diminished over the years, but uh, if I look back at, um, I still have more than average, but when I was younger, I, it was scary how much energy I had. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do much more. You, do, you, you need less sleep than other people. You, you have so much energy that you can... Um, store much more information than other people. And yeah, I think yeah. this energy is magnetic. It attracts others. They love to see people love people with energy. They can borrow a little bit of your energy. Uh, and so this passion combined with my energy is probably pretty unfair. Yeah, yeah, indeed. In my book, I want to empower CEOs to become chief brand ambassadors before starting with employer branding because Good for idea. me it's yeah because <laughs> it's no use in investing in an employer branding campaign and strategy if if you don't even know who the ceo is and you don't even get to know him on on social media so um because why would an employee do all the all the work and seeing the boss doing nothing or being afraid to show himself or herself yeah exactly is that something you you have to deal with as well when you, in your work with companies to well, empower the yeah. CEOs to to, to become yeah, visible? Some, well, we're we're living in Belgium, Yanka, as you know, yeah, and we I are know. known for our humbleness huh? um, in our That's country. That's nicely so. said. That's nicely said. Yeah, but yeah, well. <laughs> A lot of people uh, rather stay hidden than known. Mm -hmm. It is something in our education. Eh? In French, we say, vivons caché, vivons heureux. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people live like this. Um, I don't know for the other European countries, uh, perhaps the French are like that as well, but I've been raised by, I am a French born person. So I mix uh, the cultures a little bit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, then it's hard if you, you are, um, appreciated for your humbleness to speak up, to, to come out, 
to do debate clubs like other countries do, uh, to be outspoken. Um, in Belgium, you kind of uh, can be targeted for it, like we call now cancelled, uh, which is the, egg, the, the, the polarized version of the same. But people are scared to, to, to come out. Uh, they feel more risk by doing so. They don't know as much, the, um, and they are probably a little bit afraid. They don't know as much the advantages of being mm. uh, out there. And the thing is, as you say, it was fine so far. But the new generations, they are very... Um, mature about social media they really know what is bad about it and they they manage it much better than we do on a on a time uh, spent and when to log out and to be not off online all the time they are much better than i uh, but um, they expect indeed ceos to be transparent perhaps they they don't want them to to be on social all the time like elon musk is but they really want them to be transparent, not to hide, because if you hide, then they think you have something to hide. Mm -hmm. So without being uh, like a rock star on social media, uh, there is another way. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to reading your book, Yanka, but uh, which is not out as we speak now. Otherwise, I would have. <laughs> yes, huh? yes, indeed. Yes. But um, yeah, I think there is a difference between being scared and being a rock star on social media. There is a whole space there. Yes. You can, yes. you can step in and you can become for, especially in the newer generations, more mm -hmm. transparent, uh, more, um, the, the, uh, the spokesperson of your company. We yeah. have spokesperson. It is an official job called a lot. It's often corporate affairs or something or spokesperson, but, in many cases, we expect the CEO to become or to be the spokesperson and not to delegate it all the time. And when yeah. relevant, be a storyteller uh, on social media just to be an, the brand ambassador of your own company. Yeah. yeah. It looks very normal when I say it out like, like this, but mm -hmm. the, most of them don't. So there's a yeah, huge indeed. market for you, Ianka, to convince them uh, because most of them don't. Yeah. In my book, I, I show them the levels of personal branding that starts with the lowest level is just becoming a visible CEO. And just by doing that would make a huge difference in the war for talent, in the company branding, just by being visible. It's, sure. it's the basic, it's the fundament. And then you can, is there's a, the next level, it's, it's becoming the, the brand ambassador. Um, which is for me also quite obvious because you're the chief. Yeah. <laughs> so you should be a brand yes. ambassador as well. They're probably internally, they're probably internally very outspoken, giving regular quarterly uh, presentations to their mm -hmm. top levels, uh, hopefully a bigger uh, whole company, all uh, employees kind of speeches. They, they are, uh, and they are very magnetic when uh, telling stories, uh, but I, I believe they have to get over a certain fear, uh, mm -hmm. which is not, which is based on, on rational uh, experiences they saw in yeah. the market. And, and the, so yeah. Yeah. This, this fear needs to be addressed too. Why should you versus the risk that you feel you will be taking? And yeah. why, when are those risks really exaggerated and which ones are really uh, accurate and how to tackle them? Otherwise, yes. they will how, not move. How, how big is the percentage of risk? risk? Because when you're not on social, when you're not there and something yeah. happens, then you don't have an audience. Then you but you're always have... there. Yeah. Even if you're not, that's the whole thing. It's like mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 ex the example of your TikTok uh, employee who has 100,000 followers. If she is or, or he is, then your company is, and then you can't control the narrative. So yeah, that's uh, even if you think you're not on social, you always are. So it's, it's mm -hmm. really a tricky thing. You just can't be not on social. It's mm -hmm. not happening. It's yeah. happening without you. And that's the worst thing that CEOs don't like is not to have control. So if there's a reason they, they, they would go, it's 
to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and have their own media, owned media. Yes. So um, what about your chief brand ambassadorship? Uh, I see you posting a lot of team building activities. You really elevate your people, your interns. Um, uh, you do that very consciously. I see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You also have a huge following on LinkedIn. You're very, very active. Yeah. You just don't don't post the company news no that is really engaging posts cross industry so you really putting big effort in your social presence is that because True. you're a marketer yeah you need to be able to give the yeah. example somewhere so it that, that's already a good reason to do so you just demonstrate what you what you stand for partially so that's that's a good reason to do it. Uh, the, another reason to do it is I don't have any account management in my company, so we don't have any salespeople. We all we sell by experience, like uh, I think it's called uh, solution selling. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in social selling. So you just share your knowledge, and karma does the rest. Uh, and that's how I've been living for eight years. Um, people know what you stand for. And as soon as you, they need you, they, they contact you because you can't know um, if somebody can tell me the secret, please call me or send me a, a message on LinkedIn. But you just can't know when people need you. So you need to be on eh? mm -hmm. um, you need all to the be time. There. Yes, you yeah, need to be, you need there. To be in their yeah. attention span quite often. So when they need you, they know what you stand for or they have an idea what you stand for and they check out if you can help them, yes or no. Yeah. Um, that's the important thing. Uh, and let's not forget, your, um, you, you know I exist, Yanka, so thanks for that. So you probably see a little bit more than the average person about me. Um, but... If I post like 12 times a month, I may be happy that my target audience sees it once a month. So let's not over evaluate your own effort. Mm -hmm. There is really like 10% that hits your target and it's not a lot. So the effort is disproportionate. And if people yeah. really like you, like I hope you do, they see more. And they say, isn't it a little bit much, Carol, all your posting? Well, if everybody would really read what I write, then it would be much. But that's not the case. People read like one article in 10, mm -hmm. one in 10 or something, uh, one in 12, I think. So uh, you need to generate a lot of content and every because you don't know which one they're going to read. If, if that yeah, would be yeah. the case, it would be easy. Eh? Yeah. So the 12 cases a month are read by different people. Um, and that's why you have to work hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, work hard like this or in another way is just a choice. Huh? You mm -hmm. can't um, have a sales force of 20 people with a car and send them around or have them call people just to check out if they need you. It doesn't work for me probably works for a lot of other brands and products but it doesn't for me mm -hmm. um, and yes if if they if you only speak when there is a disaster happening when then the CEO really comes well then how could you have built trust yes. how can they say yeah I know that guy and when he speaks he always is on point no you're the guy the, you're kind of the crisis manager because you only are on tv when things go bad Mm -hmm. When your your financial analysts say that you're gonna go down, or uh, or your products uh, need to be uh, pulled off the market, or any any other disaster, so it's also good to have something to put in in balance with negativity. Uh, mm -hmm. Is is control the narrative? If people say a lot of negative things about your domain or your sector, like me in marketing, people hate marketing all the time, eh? which makes me very sad. So your, 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 your only defense is tell your story. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And then it balances a little bit, but you have people that only talk when things go down the drain. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit late. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it's a bit late, yeah. Now, we get to know you in uh, different ways, not only as a CEO, not only as a marketer, but only as a person, because you do share personal stuff as well. 
Um, a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're a runner. You like to run. Yeah. You do that often. Yeah. Um, yeah. You you like a good wine sold by your husband. <laughs> Yeah, I like my like, husband a lot. Like I like him more than the wine. Than the wine, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, but you are also the brand ambassador for other people's brands. Then I refer... If you say, to yeah, if you say Kaiba. so. Well, I, yeah, I, when I love something, I really love something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, think that's true. A, it's true. You really love doing that as well. And do you think that is important for you as a person in, in how you see your personal brand that you dare to speak out for other brands as well? Oh, I do speak for other people more than I do for other brands. Mm -hmm. uh, if tomorrow Ina and Helga do something else, I will do the same. Yeah. I was an, I admired the, the courage that they had to go in a very competitive market. Like I was, what, mm -hmm. what are you doing? It's like a bloodbath and you're going to go in there, in there. Are you crazy or what? <laughs> so I was really amazed by their courage. Uh, I knew they were very um, strong uh, yeah, ladies because of where they came from. They had very strong credentials. So they had a lot of things on their side to succeed. But then again, it, it mm -hmm. took a lot of courage. So that's what I see then in those uh, ladies. And that's why I think, yeah, somebody should say this, like, look how courageous they are. Um, but that's the person more than I love the bags, but I do love the persons more than I mm -hmm. love their bags. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I try to to tell the story because sometimes people don't believe me that there are local examples So I tell, but yes, it exists. Look at them. <laughs> uh, and so I, I uh, you see that I talk about them uh, online, but I talk about them much more offline to other people, to other entrepreneurs who are similar or could have the same dreams or the same goals. And then I use what I know. Mm -hmm. And those are a lot of international examples, but also a lot of local ones. Uh, and that's yeah. why I, I do that to give examples, to give cr credits to, to, uh, to the Kayback founders, but also to, to show other entrepreneurs that there are cases here close to them um, where they can yeah. find perhaps the courage to, to move on. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why I do it. Last question. Um, what is your next big goal? within the near future or far future? What is something you still want to oh, try Very simple out? things. Very simple things. I right. really just want to be happy as much as possible. It's like not the sun doesn't shine every day. That's not the weather. But I try to, to look uh, at every small thing in nature that makes me happy. So being happy is, is, uh, is like a sport. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a... It is a goal, but... Uh, it is a luxury still to be happy and as much as possible. Uh, just being grateful helps you to be very happy all the time. I don't have like economic goals and, and those things. I've, I think I must have the luxury to, uh, to not be worrying about that because of my skill. I will always, if my company goes bust, I will always be working even if I have to, to do the dishes somewhere in the center of this, of my little mm -hmm. town here, you know? So I'll manage. Uh, and then, yeah, it's the other thing I'm very um, yeah, passionate about is health. Um, mm. It is really crucial. You can't do anything. Your passion yes. is nowhere without your, without your health. So I, uh, trust me, my employees really think I'm their mother sometimes. Uh, like, yeah, I, I really kind of oblige them to live a healthy life, to have a good in French, they also say something, I don't know if they, the English say so, and then the Dutch, I don't think so, but it's called hygiene de vie, which is having uh, yeah. a, a life hygiene. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing to, to live by, is you need to be healthy, uh, hygienic, and not only on washing your teeth every day, but having an hygienic life. Mm -hmm. And that goes through, for me, You are what you eat. Uh, you, I think sleep is very important to monitor. Uh, 
when you're 28 plus, <laughs> <laughs> then suddenly sleep becomes important. Um, yeah, uh, being active. Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, we learned so much during the pandemic about mental health, about stress, what's good stress, what's bad stress, those things. So, mm -hmm. see, if you ask me what are my goals, they're more there than they are on, mm -hmm. on the marketing level. That's why marketing has its limits. Um, I'm just blessed to get money for what I adore to do. But then I think happiness and health are topping Mm -hmm. Any, I agree. And the older we get, the more we uh, yeah, realize. But I, have, I, I have this for many years. It's, it started uh, at 11 when mm -hmm. I decided in my uh, young age to stop eating meat when it wasn't popular at all. There weren't any meat crises in the near future. And I just want, don't, didn't want to do it. And there was only one book in the library. There was only one diet store in the area. And I just wanted, I was so much convinced that I tried for many years. And then my mother just went to the doctors and the doctor said, it's okay, she's big. I was tall <laughs> for my age. And if she minds uh, the substitutes for meat, it will be okay. So I, I've been into healthy stuff. And I can, could probably do better but for, for always. Um, mm -hmm. And I tried to, to spread it around um, spread by walking, for instance, doing my meetings, uh, by walking around. Yeah. You walk a lot, a lot too. Yes. So. yes, yes. Okay, we have come to an end of our conversation. So um, I want to end with wishing you good luck, but in an unconventional way, as we always do as actors, we use different words. <laughs> words that might uh, are sometimes weird to hear, but they're meant to, to be uh, really from heart, wishing you all the good luck. So I'm going, going to give you three options and you have to pick one of them. So we have three options to wish each other good luck, okay? This is the first one. The first one is break a leg. Mm -hmm. So I wish you good luck by saying break a leg. The second one is a French swear word, merde. Means good luck for actors. And the third one comes from a Yiddish incantation and it's toy, toy, toy. So how can I wish you all the best and good luck? Oh, it's very easy to choose. Merde. <laughs> merde. Merde. <laughs> Bonne chance. Merci d'être ici. Thank you Merci, very much for being here. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for the Bye. nice interview. I'm a bigger fan now. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>